Section 1 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, Part 1, Derue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 5, Part 1, Derue by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by George Burnham Ives. Section 1. One September afternoon in 1751, towards half-past five, about a score of small boys, chattering, pushing, and tumbling over one another like a covey of partridges, issued from one of the religious schools of Chartres. The joy of the little troop just escaped from a long and wearisome captivity was doubly great. A slight accident to one of the teachers had caused the class to be dismissed half an hour earlier than usual, and in consequence of the extra work thrown on the teaching staff, the brother whose duty it was to see all the scholars safe home was compelled to omit that part of his daily task. Therefore, not only thirty or forty minutes were stolen from work, but there was also unexpected, uncontrolled liberty, free from the surveillance of that black cossacked overseer who kept order in their ranks. Thirty minutes. At that age it is a century of laughter and prospective games. Each had promised solemnly, under pain of severe punishment, to return straight to his paternal nest without delay. But the air was so fresh and pure, the country smiled all around. The school, or preferably the cage, which had just opened, lay at the extreme edge of one of the suburbs, and it only required a few steps to slip under a cluster of trees by a sparkling brook beyond which rose undulating ground, breaking the monotony of a vast and fertile plain. Was it possible to be obedient, to refrain from the desire to spread one's wings? The scent of the meadow mounted to the heads of the steadiest among them, and intoxicated even the most timid. It was resolved to betray the confidence of the reverend fathers, even at the risk of disgrace and punishment next morning, supposing the escapade were discovered. A flock of sparrows, suddenly released from a cage, could not have flown more wildly into the little wood. They were all about the same age, the eldest might be nine. They flung off coats and waistcoats, and the grass became strewn with baskets, copy-books, dictionaries, and catechisms while the crowd of fair-haired heads, of fresh and smiling faces, noisily consulted as to which game should be chosen, a boy who had taken no part in the general gaiety, and who had been carried away by the rush without being able to escape sooner, glided slyly away among the trees, and, thinking himself unseen, was beating a hasty retreat, when one of his comrades cried out, "'Antoine is running away!' Two of the best runners immediately started in pursuit, and the fugitive, notwithstanding his start, was speedily overtaken, seized by his collar, and brought back as a deserter. "'Where were you going?' the others demanded. "'Home to my cousins,' replied the boy. "'There's no harm in that.' "'You canting sneak,' said another boy, putting his fist under the captive's chin. "'You were going to the master to tell on us.' "'Pierre!' responded Antoine. You know quite well I never tell lies. Indeed. Only this morning you pretended I had taken a book you had lost, and you did it because I kicked you yesterday, and you didn't dare to kick me back again. Antoine lifted his eyes to heaven and folding his arms on his breast. Dear Boutel, he said, you are mistaken. I have always been taught to forgive injuries. Listen, listen, he might be saying his prayers cried the other boys, and a volley of offensive epithets, enforced by cuffs, was hurled at the culprit. Pierre Boutel, whose influence was great, put a stop to this onslaught. "'Look here, Antoine. You are a bad lot, that we all know. You are a sneak and a hypocrite. It's time we put a stop to it. Take off your coat and fight it out. If you like, we will fight every morning and evening till the end of the month.' The proposition was loudly applauded and Pierre, turning up his sleeves as far as his elbows, prepared to suit actions to words. The challenger assuredly did not realize the full meaning of his words. Had he done so, this chivalrous defiance would simply have been an act of cowardice on his part, for there could be no doubt as to the victor in such a conflict. The one was a boy of alert and gallant bearing, strong upon his legs, supple and muscular, a vigorous man in embryo while the other, not quite so old, small, thin, of a sickly leaden complexion, seemed as if he might be blown away by a strong puff of wind. His skinny arms and legs hung on to his body like the claws of a spider, his fair hair inclined to red, his white skin appeared nearly bloodless, and the consciousness of weakness made him timid 
and gave a shifty, uneasy look to his eyes. His whole expression was uncertain, and looking only at his face, it was difficult at first sight to decide to which sex he belonged. This confusion of two natures, this indefinable mixture of feminine weakness without grace, and of abortive boyhood, seemed to stamp him as something exceptional, unclassable, and once observed it was difficult to take one's eyes from him. Had he been endowed with physical strength, he would have been a terror to his comrades, exercising by fear the ascendancy which Pierre owed to his joyous temper and unwearied gaiety, for this mean exterior concealed extraordinary powers of will and dissimulation. Guided by instinct, the other children hung about Pierre and willingly accepted his leadership. By instinct, also, they avoided Antoine, repelled by a feeling of chill as if from the neighborhood of a reptile, and shunning him unless to profit in some way by their superior strength. Never would he join their games without compulsion. His thin, colorless lips seldom parted for a laugh, and even at the tender age his smile had an unpleasantly sinister expression. "'Will you fight?' again demanded Pierre. Antoine glanced hastily round. There was no chance of escape. A double ring enclosed him. To accept or refuse seemed about equally risky. He ran a good chance of a thrashing whichever way he decided. Although his heart beat loudly, no trace of emotion appeared on his pallid cheek. An unforeseen danger would have made him shriek. But he had had time to collect himself, time to shelter behind hypocrisy. As soon as he could lie and cheat, he recovered courage, and the instinct of cunning once roused prevailed over everything else. Instead of answering the second challenge, he knelt down and said to Pierre, "'You are much stronger than I am.' This submission disarmed his antagonist. "'Get up,' he replied. "'I won't touch you if you can't defend yourself.' "'Pierre,' continued Antoine, still on his knees, "'I assure you, by God and the Holy Virgin, I was not going to tell. I was going home to my cousins to learn my lessons for tomorrow. You know how slow I am.' If you think I have done you any harm, I ask your forgiveness. Pierre held out his hand and made him get up. Will you be a good fellow, Antoine, and play with us? Yes, I will. All right, then, let us forget all about it. What are we to play at? asked Antoine, taking off his coat. Thieves and archers! cried one of the boys. Splendid! said Pierre and using his acknowledged authority he divided them into two sides, ten highwaymen whom he was to command, and ten archers of the guard who were to pursue them. Antoine was among the latter. The highwaymen, armed with swords and guns, obtained from the willows which grew along the brook, moved off first and gained the valleys between the little hills beyond the wood. The fight was to be serious, and any prisoner on either side was to be tried immediately. The robbers divided into twos and threes and hid themselves in the ravines. A few minutes later the archers started in pursuit. There were encounters, surprises, skirmishes, but whenever it came to close quarters, Pierre's men, skillfully distributed, united on hearing his whistle, and the army of justice had to retreat. But there came a time when this magic signal was no longer heard, and the robbers became uneasy and remained crouching in their hiding places. Pierre, over daring, had undertaken to defend alone the entrance of a dangerous passage, and to stop the whole hostile troop there. Whilst he kept them engaged, half of his men, concealed on the left, were to come round the foot of the hill and make a rush on hearing his whistle. The other half, also stationed at some little distance, were to execute the same maneuver from above. The archers would be caught in a trap, and attacked both in front and rear would be obliged to surrender at discretion. Chance, which not unfrequently decides the fate of a battle, defeated this excellent stratagem. Watching intently, Pierre failed to perceive that while his whole attention was given to the ground in front, the archers had taken an entirely different road from the one they ought to have followed if his combination were to succeed. They suddenly fell upon him from behind, and before he could blow his whistle, they gagged him with a handkerchief and tied his hands. Six remained to keep the field of battle and disperse the hostile band, now deprived of its chief. The remaining four conveyed Pierre to the little wood, while the robbers, hearing no signal, did not venture to stir. According to the agreement, Pierre Battelle was tried by the archers, who promptly transformed themselves into a court of justice, and as he had been taken red-handed and did not condescend to defend himself, the trial was not a long affair. He was unanimously sentenced to be hung. 
and the execution was then and there carried out at the request of the criminal himself, who wanted the game to be properly played to the end, and who actually selected a suitable tree for his own execution. "'But, Pierre,' said one of the judges, "'how can you be held up there?' "'How stupid you are!' returned the captive. "'I shall only pretend to be hung, of course. See here!' and he fastened together several pieces of strong string which had tied some of the other boys' books, piled the latter together, and standing on tiptoe on this very insecure basis, fastened one end of the cord to a horizontal bow, and put his neck into a running knot at the other end, endeavoring to imitate the contortions of an actual sufferer. Shouts of laughter greeted him, and the victim laughed the loudest of all. Three archers went to call the rest to behold this amusing spectacle, one, tired out, remained with the prisoner. "'Ah, hangman,' said Pierre, putting out his tongue at him. "'Are the books firm? I thought I felt them give way.' "'No,' replied Antoine. It was he who remained. "'Don't be afraid, Pierre.' "'It is a good thing, for if they fell I don't think the cord is long enough.' "'Don't you really think so?' A horrible thought showed itself like a flash on the child's face. He resembled a young hyena scenting blood for the first time. He glanced at the pile of books Pierre was standing on and compared it with the length of the cord between the branch and his neck. It was already nearly dark. The shadows were deepening in the wood. Gleams of pale light penetrated between the trees. The leaves had become black and rustled in the wind. Antoine stood silent and motionless, listening if any sound could be heard near them. It would be a curious study for the moralist to observe how the first thought of crime develops itself in the recesses of the human heart, and how this poisoned germ grows and stifles all other sentiments. An impressive lesson might be gathered from this struggle of two opposing principles, however weak it may be in perverted natures. In cases where judgment can discern, where there is power to choose between good and evil, the guilty person has only himself to blame, and the most heinous crime is only the action of its perpetrator. It is a human action, the result of passions which might have been controlled, and one's mind is not uncertain nor one's conscience doubtful as to the guilt. But how can one conceive this taste for murder in a young child? How imagine it, without being tempted to exchange the idea of eternal sovereign justice for that of blind fatality? How can one judge without hesitation between the moral sense which has given way and the instinct which displays itself? How not exclaim that the designs of a creator who retains the one and impels the other are sometimes mysterious and inexplicable, and that one must submit without understanding? "'Do you hear them coming?' asked Pierre. "'I hear nothing,' replied Antoine, and a nervous shiver ran through all his members. "'So much the worse.' I am tired of being dead. I shall come to life and run after them. Hold the books, and I will undo the noose. If you move, the books will separate. Wait, I will hold them. And he knelt down, and collecting all his strength, gave the pile a violent push. Pierre endeavored to raise his hands to his throat. What are you d doing? he cried in a suffocating voice. I'm paying you out, replied Antoine, folding his arms. Pierre's feet were only a few inches from the ground, and the weight of his body at first bent the bow for a moment, but it rose again, and the unfortunate boy exhausted himself in useless efforts. At every movement the knot grew tighter, his legs struggled, his arms sought vainly something to lay hold of, then his movements slackened, his limbs stiffened, and his hands sank down. Of so much life and vigor, nothing remained but the movement of an inert mass turning round and round upon itself. Not till then did Antoine cry for help, and when the other boys hastened up they found him crying and tearing his hair. So violent indeed were his sobs and his despair that he could hardly be understood as he tried to explain how the books had given way under Pierre, and how he had vainly endeavored to support him in his arms. This boy, left an orphan at three years old, had been brought up at first by a relation who turned him out for theft, afterwards by two sisters, his cousins who were already beginning to take alarm at his abnormal perversity. This pale and fragile being, an incorrigible thief, a consummate hypocrite, and a cold-blooded assassin, was predestined to an immortality of crime, and was to find a place among the most execrable monsters for whom humanity has ever had the blush. His name was Antoine-Francois Derues.
Twenty years had gone by since this horrible and mysterious event, which no one sought to unravel at the time it occurred. One June evening, 1771, four persons were sitting in one of the rooms of a modestly furnished dwelling on the third floor of a house in the Rue Saint-Victor. The party consisted of three women and an ecclesiastic, who boarded for meals only with the woman who tenanted the dwelling. The other two were near neighbors. They were all friends, and often met thus in the evening to play cards. They were sitting round the card table, but although it was nearly ten o'clock, the cards had not yet been touched. They spoke in low tones, and a half-interrupted confidence had, this evening, put a check on the usual gaiety. Someone knocked gently at the door, although no sounds of steps on the creaking wooden staircase had been heard, and a wheedling voice asked for admittance. The occupier of the room, Madame Legrand, rose and admitted a man of about six-and-twenty, at whose appearance the four friends exchanged glances, at once observed by the newcomer, who affected, however, not to see them. He bowed successively to the three women and several times with the utmost respect to the abbey, making signs of apology for the interruption caused by his appearance. Then, coughing several times, he turned to Madame Legrand and said in a feeble voice, which seemed to betoken much suffering, "'My kind mistress, will you and these other ladies excuse my presenting myself at such an hour and in such a costume? I am ill, and I was obliged to get up.' His costume was certainly singular enough. He was wrapped in a large dressing-gown of flowered chintz. His head was adorned by a nightcap drawn up at the top and surmounted by a muslin frill. His appearance did not contradict his complaint of illness. He was barely four feet six in height. His limbs were bony, his face sharp, thin, and pale. Thus attired, coughing incessantly, dragging his feet as if he had no strength to lift them, Holding a lighted candle in one hand and an egg in the other, he suggested a caricature, some imaginary invalid just escaped from Monsieur Purgon. Nevertheless, no one ventured to smile, notwithstanding his valetudinarian appearance and his air of affected humility, or the perpetual blinking of the yellow eyelids which fell over the round and hollow eyes, shining with a somber fire which he could never entirely suppress, reminded one of a bird of prey unable to face the light and the lines of his face, the hooked nose, and the thin, constantly quivering, drawn-in lips suggested a mixture of boldness and baseness, of cunning and sincerity. But there is no book which can instruct one to read the human countenance correctly, and some special circumstance must have roused the suspicions of these four persons so much as to cause them to make these observations, and they were not, as usual, deceived by the humbug of this skilled actor, a past master in the art of deception. He continued after a moment's silence, as if he did not wish to interrupt their mute observation. "'Will you oblige me by a neighborly kindness?' "'What is it, Derues?' asked Madame Legrand. A violent cough, which appeared to rend his chest, prevented him from answering immediately, when it ceased, he looked at the abbey and said with a melancholy smile, "'What I ought to ask in my present state of health is your blessing, my father, and your intercession for the pardon of my sins. But every one clings to the life which God has given him. We do not easily abandon hope. Moreover, I have always considered it wrong to neglect such means of preserving our lives as are in our power.' since life is for us only a time of trial, and the longer and harder the trial, the greater our recompense in a better world. Whatever befalls us, our answer should be that of the Virgin Mary to the angel who announced the mystery of the Incarnation. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. You are right, said the abbey, with a severe and inquisitorial look under which Derues remained quite untroubled. It is an attribute of God to reward and to punish, and the Almighty is not deceived by him who deceives men. The psalmist has said, Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. He has said also, The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Derues promptly replied, This exchange of quotations from Scripture might have lasted for hours without his being at a loss, had the abbey thought fit to continue in this strain, but such a style of conversation, garnished with grave and solemn words, seemed almost sacrilegious in the mouth of a man of such ridiculous appearance, a profanation at once sad and grotesque. 
Derues seemed to comprehend the impression it produced, and tuning again to Madame Legrand, he said, "'We have gotten a long way from what I came to ask you, my kind friend. I was so ill that I went early to bed, but I cannot sleep and I have no fire. Will you have the kindness to have this egg mulled for me?' "'Cannot your servant do that for you?' asked Madame Legrand. "'I gave her leave to go out this evening, and though it is late she has not yet returned. If I had a fire I would not give you so much trouble, but I do not care to light one at this hour. Uh, you know I am always afraid of accidents, and they so easily happen.' "'Very well, then,' replied Madame Legrand. "'Go back to your room, and my servant will bring it to you.' "'Thank you.' said Derues, bowing. "'Many thanks.' As he turned to depart, Madame Legrand spoke again. "'This day week, Derues, you have to pay me half the twelve hundred livres due for the purchase of my business.' "'So soon as that?' "'Certainly, and I want the money. Have you forgotten the date, then?' "'Oh, dear! I have never looked at the agreement since it was drawn up.' I did not think the time was so near. It is the fault of my bad memory. But I will contrive to pay you, although trade is very bad, and in three days I shall have to pay more than fifteen thousand livres to different people. He bowed again and departed, apparently exhausted by the effort of sustaining so long a conversation. As soon as they were alone, the abbey exclaimed, "'That man is assuredly an utter rascal!' May God forgive him his hypocrisy. How is it possible we could allow him to deceive us for so long? But, my father, interposed one of the visitors, are you really sure of what you have just said? I am not now speaking of the seventy-nine louis d'or which have been stolen from me, although I never mentioned to anyone but you, and he was then present, that I possess such a sum, and although that very day he made a false excuse for coming to my rooms when I was out— Theft is indeed infamous, but slander is not less so, and he has slandered you disgracefully. Yes, he has spread a report that you, Madame Legrand, you, his former mistress and benefactress, have put temptation in his way, and desired to commit carnal sin with him. This has now whispered the neighborhood all around us. It will soon be said aloud, and we have been so completely as dupes. We have helped him so much to acquire a reputation for uprightness that it would now be impossible to destroy our own work. If I were to accuse him of theft, and you charge him with lying, probably neither of us would be believed. Beware, these odious tales have not been spread without a reason. Now that your eyes are open, beware of him. Yes, replied Madame Legrand. My brother-in-law warned me three years ago. One day Derues said to my sister-in-law, I remember the words perfectly, I should like to be a druggist, because one would always be able to punish an enemy, and if one has a quarrel with any one, it would be easy to get rid of him by means of a poisoned draught. I neglected these warnings. I surmounted the feeling of repugnance I first felt at the sight of him. I have responded to his advances, and I greatly fear that I may have cause to repent it. But you know him as well as I do. Who would not have thought his piety sincere? Who would not still think so? And notwithstanding all you have said, I still hesitate to feel serious alarm. I am unwilling to believe in such utter depravity. The conversation continued in this strain for some time, and then, as it was getting late, the party separated. Next morning, early, a large and noisy crowd was assembled in the Rue Saint-Victor before Derues' shop of drugs and groceries. There was a confusion of cross-questions, of inquiries which obtained no answer, of answers not addressed to the inquiry, a medley of sound, a pell-mell of unconnected words, of affirmations, contradictions, and interrupted narrations. Here a group listened to an orator who held forth in his shirt-sleeves. A little farther there were disputes, quarrels, exclamations of, "'Poor man! Such a good fellow! My poor gossip, Derue! Good heavens! What will he do now?' "'Alas! He is quite done for. It is to be hoped his creditors will give him time!' Above all this uproar was heard a voice, sharp and piercing like a cat's, lamenting and relating with sobs the terrible misfortune of last night. 
At about three in the morning, the inhabitants of the Rue Saint-Victor had been startled out of their sleep by the cry of, Fire! Fire! A conflagration had burst forth in Derues cellar, and though its progress had been arrested and the house saved from destruction, all the goods stored therein had perished. It apparently meant a considerable loss in barrels of oil, casks of brandy, boxes of soap, etc., which Derues estimated at not less than nine thousand livres. By what unlucky chance the fire had been caused, he had no idea. He recounted his visit to Madame Legrand, and, pale, trembling, hardly able to sustain himself, he cried, "'I shall die of grief! A poor man, as ill as I am! I am lost! I am ruined!' A harsh voice interrupted his lamentations, and drew the attention of the crowd to a woman carrying printed broadsides, and who forced a passage through the crowd up to the shop door. She unfolded one of her sheets and cried as loudly and distinctly as her husky voice permitted, "'Sentence pronounced by the Parliament of Paris against John Robert Castle, accused and convicted of fraudulent bankruptcy!' Derues looked up and saw a street hawker who used to come into his shop for a drink, and with whom he had a violent quarrel about a month previously, she having detected him in a piece of knavery, and abused him roundly in her own style, which was not lacking in energy. He had not seen her since. The crowd generally, and all the gossips of the quarter, who held Derues in great veneration, thought that the woman's cry was intended as an indirect insult, and threatened to punish her for this irreverence. But placing one hand on her hip and with the other warning off the most pressing by a significant gesture. Are you still befooled by his tricks, fools that you are? Yes, no doubt there was a fire in the cellar last night. No doubt his creditors regees enough to let him off paying his debts. But what you don't know is that he didn't really lose by it at all. He lost all his goods, the crowd cried on all sides. More than nine thousand livres! Oil and brandy! Do you think those won't burn? The old witch, she drinks enough to know. If one put a candle near her, she would take fire fast enough. Perhaps, replied the woman with renewed gesticulations. Perhaps, but I don't advise any of you to try. Anyhow, this fellow here is a rogue. He has been emptying his cellar for the last three nights. There were only old empty casks in it and empty packing cases. Oh, yes, I have swallowed his daily lies like everybody else. But I know the truth by now. He got his liquor taken away by Michael Lambon's son, the cobbler in the Rue de la Pachemannerie. How do I know? Why, because this young man came and told me. I turned that woman out of my shop a month ago for stealing, said Derues. Notwithstanding this retaliatory accusation, the woman's bold assertion might have changed the attitude of the crowd and chilled the enthusiasm, but at that moment a stout man pressed forward and, seizing the hawker by the arm, said, Go and hold your tongue, backbiting woman! To this man the honour of Derues was an article of faith. He had not yet ceased to wonder at the probity of this sainted person, and to doubt it in the least was as good as suspecting his own. "'My dear friend,' he said, "'we all know what to think of you. I know you well. Send to me tomorrow, and you shall have what good you want on credit, for as long as is necessary. Now, evil tongue, what do you say to that?' "'I say that you are as great a fool as the rest. Adieu, friend Derues. Go on as you have begun, and I shall be selling your sentence some day. And dispersing the crowd with a few twirls of her right arm, she passed on, crying, Sentence pronounced by the Parliament of Paris against John Robert Castle, accused and convicted of fraudulent bankruptcy. This accusation emanated from too insignificant a quarter to have any effect on Derues' reputation. However resentful he may have been at the time, he got over it in consequence of the reiterated marks of interest shown by his neighbors in all the quarter on account of his supposed ruin, and the hawker's attack passed out of his mind, or probably she might have paid for her boldness with her life. But this drunken woman had nonetheless uttered a prophetic word. It was the grain of sand on which later he was to be shipwrecked. 
all passions says la bruyere all passions are deceitful they disguise themselves as much as possible from the public eye they hide from themselves there is no vice which has not a counterfeit resemblance to some virtue and which does not profit by it the whole life of derues bears testimony to the truth of this observation an avaricious poisoner he attracted his victims by the pretense of fervent and devoted piety and drew them into the snare where he silently destroyed them his terrible celebrity only began in 1777, caused by the double murder of Madame de Lamotte and her son, and his name, unlike those of some other great criminals, does not at first recall a long series of crimes. But when one examines this low, crooked, and obscure life, one finds a fresh stain at every step, and perhaps no one has ever surpassed him in dissimulation, in profound hypocrisy, in indefatigable depravity. Derues was executed at thirty-two, and his whole life was steeped in vice. Though happily so short, it is full of horror, and is only a tissue of criminal thoughts and deeds, a very essence of evil. He had no hesitation, no remorse, no repose, no relaxation. He seemed compelled to lie, to steal, to poison. Occasionally suspicion is aroused, the public has its doubts, and vague rumors hover round him but he burrows under new impostures, and punishment passes by. When he falls into the hands of human justice, his reputation protects him, and for a few days more the legal sword is turned aside. Hypocrisy is so completely a part of his nature that even when there is no longer any hope, when he is irrevocably sentenced and he knows that he can no longer deceive anyone, neither mankind nor him whose name he profanes by this last sacrilege, he yet exclaims, O oh Christ, I shall suffer even as thou. It is only by the light of his funeral pyre that the dark places of his life can be examined, that this bloody plot is unraveled, and that other victims, forgotten and lost in the shadows, arise like spectres at the foot of a scaffold, and escort the assassin to his doom. Let us trace rapidly the history of Derues' early years, effaced and forgotten in the notoriety of his death, these few pages are not written for the glorification of crime, and if in our own days, as a result of the corruption of our manners, and of a deplorable confusion of all notions of right and wrong, it has been sought to make him an object of public interest, we on our part only wish to bring him into notice, and place him momentarily on a pedestal, in order to cast him still lower, that his fall may yet be greater." What has been permitted by God may be related by man. Decaying and satiated communities need not be treated as children. They require neither diplomatic handling nor precaution, and it may be good that they should see and touch the putrescent sores which canker them. Why fear to mention that which everyone knows? Why dread to sound the abyss which can be measured by everyone? Why fear to bring into the light of day unmasked wickedness, even though it confronts the public gaze unblushingly? Extreme turpitude and extreme excellence are both in the schemes of providence, and the poet has summed up eternal morality for all ages and nations in this sublime exclamation, Abstuli tunc tandum rufini poem tumultum. Besides, and we cannot insist too earnestly that our intention must not be mistaken, if we had wished to inspire any other sentiment than that of horror, we should have chosen a more imposing personage from the annals of crime. There have been deeds which required audacity, a sort of grandeur, a false heroism. There have been criminals who held in check all the regular and legitimate forces of society, and whom one regarded with a mixture of terror and pity. There is nothing of that in Derues, not even a trace of courage. Nothing but a shameless cupidity, exercising itself at first in the theft of a few pence filched from the poor. Nothing but the illicit gains and rascalities of a cheating shopkeeper and vile money-lender, a depraved cowardice which dared not strike openly, but slew in the dark. It is the story of an unclean reptile, which drags itself underground, leaving everywhere the trail of its poisonous saliva. Such was the man whose life we have undertaken to narrate, a man who represents a complete type of wickedness, and who corresponds to the most hideous sketch ever devised by poet or romance writer. 
facts without importance of their own, which would be childish if recorded of anyone else, obtain a somber reflection from other facts which precede them, and thenceforth cannot be passed over in silence. The historian is obliged to collect and note them, as showing the logical development of this degraded being. He unites them in sequence and counts the successive steps of the ladder mounted by the criminal. We have seen the early exploit of this assassin by instinct. We find him, twenty years later, an incendiary and a fraudulent bankrupt. What had happened in the interval? With how much treachery and crime had he filled this space of twenty years? Let us return to his infancy. His unconquerable taste for theft caused him to be expelled by the relations who had taken charge of him. An anecdote is told which shows his impudence and incurable perversity. One day he was caught taking some money and was soundly whipped by his cousins. When this was over, the child, instead of showing any sorrow or asking forgiveness, ran away with a sneer, and seeing they were out of breath, exclaimed, "'You are tired, are you? Well, I am not!' Despairing of any control over this evil disposition, the relations refused to keep him, and sent him to Chartres, where two other cousins agreed to have him out of charity. They were simple-minded women, of great and sincere piety, who imagined that good example and religious teaching might have a happy influence on their young relation. The result was contrary to their expectation. The sole fruit of their teaching was that Derues learned to be a cheat and a hypocrite, and to assume the mask of respectability. Here also repeated thefts ensured him sound corrections, knowing his cousin's extreme economy, not to say avarice, he mocked them when they broke a lath over his shoulders. "'There, now, I am so glad. That will cost you two farthings.' His benefactresses, patients, becoming exhausted, he left their house, and was apprenticed to a tin man at Chartres. His master died, and an ironmonger of the same town took him as a shop-boy, and from this he passed on to a druggist and grocer. Until now, although fifteen years old, he had shown no preference for one trade more than another, but it was now necessary he should choose some profession, and his share in the family property amounted to the modest sum of three thousand five hundred livres. His residence with his last master revealed a decided taste, but it was only another evil instinct developing itself. The poisoner had scented poison. Being always surrounded with drugs which were health-giving or hurtful, according to the use made of them. Derues would probably have settled at Chartres, but repeated thefts obliged him to leave the town, the profession of druggist and grocer being one which presented most chances of fortune, and being, moreover, adapted to his tastes, his family apprenticed him to a grocer in the Rue Comtesse d'Artois, paying a specified premium for him. End of section 1. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.